Well, good, good evening, everybody. How are you? Good to have you here once again. Uh, you know me. So my name is right here, Father Paul. Okay, that's where I got my name tag. So how good it is for us to be here tonight. Uh, you know the routine, don't you? You stand up. You try and reach somebody that you didn't know, didn't meet the last two nights. You tell them how much money you give to church. No, 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 that's, that's the old line. That's, but I want, you to, I want you to tell people this time what street you live on and what your favorite store is in town. Okay, so up and at them. Okay. All right already, all right already, that's enough. Calm down. Okay, okay. Quiet down, boys and girls. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, great, this is our third evening. You know, one of the things that uh, we priests have always said if we got somebody in the chancery office who's, uh, you know, running the show next to the bishop, which uh, Father Dan is, if only that priest can have some parish experience before he gets into the big desk. And Father Dan fits the bill 100%. How many years have you been pastoring before you came? 33 years. One of his big assignments was down at St. Raphael's, when that place was just booming, and uh, he made it boom all the more in the Lord. And then, uh, well, his real claim to fame, his real claim to fame is Manitowoc, my hometown. He was assigned in Manitowoc, and he had just a little task. It was simply to take six parishes and make them one. And he did it. And it took a long time and a lot of talking and a lot of praying and a lot of organization, but it's now Francis, St. Francis of Assisi Parish in Manitowoc. And to top it all off, in the middle of that, he had to shut down two of the churches, one of which was St. Paul's, my home parish. <laughs> and he did it without ticking off my sister. Corrine loves him. She thinks he's six foot nine. I mean, really, and he, she had, my sister was very involved in the parish, as were my folks, and uh, it was painful, as it always is when there's transitions like that. But he had the grace of God uh, behind him, and uh, he has, uh, did a marvelous, marvelous job of that. And the hometown is still standing, uh, and now he is... Uh, then he went out to Macville, where you were from, went and served there and a couple of the other neighboring parishes, and then uh, he came to the chancery office two years ago. Yeah, and he was, uh, he had gone and studied to Rome, in Rome as after he was ordained and got a degree, advanced degree in communications and theology. And so uh, he's a very uh, a gifted man for our parish and for our diocese. So we welcome tonight Father Dan Felton, Vicar General of the Diocese of Green Bay. Dan, welcome. 
Thank you, Father Paul, for that uh, very gracious introduction. And my gosh, I, I'm, I really have to live up to a billing. I didn't have a, a, a great expectation before, but uh, as I've been ordained 35 years, uh, there are certain priests that we continue to look to to be a great source of inspiration to us, serve as great models of what it means to be a pastor, and especially to be a servant. And certainly, Father Paul remains that for me personally, but for many of the priests uh, in the Diocese of Green Bay. So let's just acknowledge that tonight, Father Paul, and the great priest he is, the great job he has done here, and many other places as well. It's the third night of your parish mission, and I'm very grateful and happy to be here. And as we have the other evenings, uh, I would invite you just to pause for a moment and let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we abandon ourselves into your hands. This night, do with us what you will. Whatever you do, we thank you. We are ready for all. We accept all. Let only your will be done tonight. Father, into your hands, we commend our soul. We give it to you with all of our love, for we do love you. And we need to give ourselves and surrender ourselves into your hands without reserve and with boundless confidence. For truly you are our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? Uh, St. Charles Foucault wrote that prayer. And in fact, it's a prayer that I pray every morning. You know, into your hands, I commend my soul. Do with me today whatever you want to do. Whatever you do, I thank you. And so it's a great way for us to begin tonight as well and to end the mission, just surrendering ourselves to the Father, giving ourselves into the Father's hands, and letting that God, letting that Father speak to us and to act in and through us tonight in whatever way that God wants to. Now, I do realize it's also the third evening, so I just want to get a gauge. I want to get a read. Just like how much more energy do you have left? You know, I know you gave a lot the last two nights, and so I'm going to gauge my talk in terms of your ability to follow a very simple instruction. And it's so simple. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to say, one, two, three. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands, and I'm going to say, one, two, three, go. And when I say, one, two, three, go, I just want you to take your right hand and gently uh, just place that or slap that on your right knee. Very simple, huh? I'm just going to go, one, two, three, go, then just take your right hand on your right knee. So I'm just going to get a read, kind of the level of intelligence I'm dealing with tonight, the depth of energy that I'm dealing with tonight. So if everybody just puts your hands right above your head, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Go. All right, I'll take things real slow tonight on this last night, real slow. So Father Paul had the opportunity to say a few things about me, and I'm guesstimating that many of you know each other already, or if you are here as a guest and not member of this parish community, do you want to raise your hand if you're not a part of Elizabeth Ann Seaton? Wonderful. We're very happy to have you here tonight. A round of applause for our guests that are with us and maybe with us through the mission. So if you're here, you might not even see these people again. So what I want you to do is I want you to reintroduce yourself to the people that are around you, not only where you like to go shopping, but I want you to introduce yourselves to each other using your middle name, using your middle name. So I'm going to give you 37 seconds to do that. Just introduce yourself to the people around you using your middle name. Twelve seconds. Alan. John. All right. Is there anybody here who does not have a middle name? All right. One person, two people, three people do not have a middle name. I'm always amazed, as long as I've been doing this uh, dynamic at the beginning of a presentation, 
There always are people who never in their life were given a middle name. Now, what you don't know is that you share this tradition with a very famous president. We had a president who did not have a middle name, and so when he was running for president, they said, well, you at least should select some letter in the alphabet so that when you got to sign documents, it'll look a little more official. So he chose arbitrarily the letter S. And so who's the president that didn't have a middle name? Harry S. Truman. Now, for those of you who know Harry Truman, and kind of his language at time, at least according to his wife, Bess, nobody had the courage to ask him what the S stood for in his name. But for those of you who do not have a middle name, you no longer in life are going to have to go through uh, life without that middle name. So before you leave here tonight, Father Paul is going to give you a middle name so that the next time somebody does this presentation, you forthrightly will be able to tell them that your middle name, if you're a man, is Daniel, and your middle name, if you're a woman, is Danielle. How does that sound, Paul? That sounds pretty good <laughs> to me. Amen. So tonight's talk is on saints alive. So let's get going. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. One more time. Here we go. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number. You know, tonight as we gather together and as we reflect upon who's in that number and how can I be in that number, we find ourselves saying, you know, if I could talk to any saint, who would I want to talk to? If I could sit down and have a conversation with any saint, who would that saint be? I just want you to think about that for nine seconds. If I could promise you that tomorrow morning I can arrange for you to meet with any saint, who would that saint be? Take seven seconds to tell the person alongside of you. What saint would you like to have a conversation with? What saint would you like to talk to? What saint would you like to ask some questions? Who are some of the saints that we would like to talk to? If we had the opportunity, if I could arrange for that tomorrow morning, anybody? Uh, St. Colby? St. Joseph? St. Joan of Arc? St. Elizabeth, your friend? St. Thomas? St. Mary? Father Pio? St. Francis? St. Joseph? St. Paul? St. Stephen? Richard, get ready. I'm coming to you. St. Mary, St. Joseph. Well, you know, we say to ourselves, oh yeah, come on, Father Dan. We can talk to the saints. Or you could arrange for me to talk to the saints tomorrow. You know, how gullible do you think we are? I'll tell you what. I can arrange for us to talk to the saints right now. Right here in this moment. St. Joseph, St. John the Baptist, pray for us. St. Joseph. St. Peter and St. Paul, St. Andrew, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Francis, St. Teresa of Jesus, St. Benedict, St. Agnes. There, we just have talked to the saints. You know, any time that we do a litany of that nature, and we're going to be doing that in a very powerful, real kind of way at the Easter Vigil as we're leading up to the baptisms, that when we pray to the saints, we believe that we are not praying to people who are dead. We're praying to people who are alive. And when we pray to the saints, they are with us in a very powerful kind of way. As they would share relationships with us here upon the earth, we believe that we can continue to share a relationship with them even while they are in heaven. 
So often there is the misconception that when we pray to the saints, like we're praying for people that are dead, for people that are no longer with us. These are people who have, are no longer dead. They've died. And by the power of Jesus Christ, they've risen. And we acknowledge as the church that they are one with God in heaven. And as they live, they continue to be a part of the communion of saints that continues to walk with us, to help us, and to support us as we walk our own path of righteousness and holiness here upon the earth, praying with and in through them to that same Jesus Christ that someday we too may be in the fullness of God's heaven and with them that we might stand before the throne of God and give God praise forever. I mean, we got to stop and think about that. Sometimes people will say, why do you Catholics pray to dead people? We're not praying to people that are dead. We're praying to people who are very much alive. And we just did that. And so that wasn't just an exercise that's very empty. We just engaged every saint that we called out, knew that we were calling out their name. And every saint that we pray to, that we spend time with, that we remain in a conversation is very much alive and wanting to help us, to guide us, and to lead us on a path of holiness to the same place where they are this very day into the fullness of God's reign and the fullness of God's kingdom. So when I just prayed to those saints, that's called the litany of saints. And like I said, on the Easter vigil, we pray that litany. If you've ever been at an ordination, we pray that litany of saints. Uh, during a baptism, many times we'll pray the litany of saints. And that litany is kind of a canon. And the word canon really means it's a measurement. These are men and women and children and young adults where we say they have measured up to what we might imagine to be a model, an example, a martyr, a person who can exemplify to us what sainthood might mean for us as well. And so as we're reflecting upon the saints tonight and we're taking a look at those saints, let us say, well, what is a saint? What does the Catholic Church teach? What is a saint? It's so simple and it's so straightforward, it'll startle you. If you go to the Catechism of the Church, the Catechism of the Church says a saint is a holy one, in union with God, through the grace of Jesus Christ, which leads that holy one and others to heaven. That's a saint. A saint is a holy one in union with God, through the grace of Jesus Christ, which leads that person, that one, and others to heaven. And again, as we acknowledge as a church, certain men and women who exemplify being in union with God through the grace of Jesus Christ, we acknowledge that not only are they getting themselves into heaven, but they're taking others and showing others how to get to heaven as well. Now, you have to be officially declared a saint to be in the litany of saints. And there's a very rigorous kind of process that you have to go through to do that. And actually, one of those things in that process is that you have to be able to show two miracles, that you were able to work two miracles in your life. Well, you're here tonight to give witness to the fact that, I got to tell you, I've got the two miracles already. I've got the two miracles down, so I'm telling you so that someday you're going to remember this. And then somebody's going to ask you about that Father Dan, and he'll say, i got to give witness. i got to tell you the story about his two miracles so that he can be included in that canon and in that measurement and that official litany of the church. My first miracle story happened when I was first ordained back in the early 1980s. And do you remember back in the early 80s that women had those beehive hairdos that were just kind of spun like this, and they went up? How many of us remember that? They were kind of spun like that? So it was the sprinkling rite, in the Easter season and there was a woman sitting like in the middle of the pew and she had one of those beehive hairdos. Well back in those days I used an evergreen branch and I'm coming down the aisle and I'm swinging and I'm a swooshing people with the water and I swing my arm and a big twig breaks off that branch. It goes flying through the air and it lands right in the middle of that woman's hairdo. That beehive has this stick. It's sticking out, but she doesn't know it. And I keep going down the aisle, and I keep looking. And by that time, people in the church, they're looking because here's this woman with this stick sticking out of her beehive head. Well, the mass just went on. Finally, the person behind her tapped her on the shoulder and showed her, or at least asked her to take that. She took it out. God's honest truth. Two years later, a woman makes an appointment with me. She comes in to see me, she sits down in the chair, 
And she said, you probably don't remember this, but she said, I'm the woman who had the hairdo that got the stick in it. She said, at that time. And then she reached into her purse and she took out the stick. She still had the little branch. And she said, at that time, I had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And she said, three weeks later, I went down to Madison to go through the regular tests. And since that time, there's been no tumor that they've been able to detect in my brain. She believes it has something to do with that twig. It had something to do with the holy water and that event and that twig. And because she came to see me, she thanked me for that in her lifetime. Now remember that. Because the second story isn't so glorious, but it's a miracle. I was walking around the hospital, going in and out of hospital rooms, and an elderly woman was sitting in the corner of the room when I walked in. I sat down on the edge of the bed, we started talking, and then I looked down and her feet were like six inches off the floor. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. And then as we're talking a little bit more, I could see she's sitting on a commode. So I said to her, well, I, I can see you're a little bit busy right now, so I'll go visit some other people, and then I'll come back to see you. She said, oh, no, no, Father, that's okay. Nothing's happening anyway. <laughs> so we were talking for a little bit, but I was not very comfortable with this situation, so I kind of made an excuse to go, and I stood up, and I reached out, and I placed my hands on her head and said that prayer of healing. And then as I was walking out of the room, and a nurse is walking into the room, I heard this woman say, it's working, Father, your prayer, it's working. That's the second miracle that you're going to have to remember someday when some little Monsignor comes to you and says, tell me about the two miracles that Father Dan worked in his lifetime. To be able to be a part of that measurement, to be a part of that canon, to be an official part of the litany of saints. Now, one of the challenges that we have in believing that the saints are alive, one of the challenges that we face in thinking that we can have a conversation with these men and women who officially have been designated as saints of the church is that they're so old. The saints that we think of, they're so old. Like they lived eons ago, centuries ago. Yeah, there, there's that St. Francis. That's wonderful, but he's 900 years old. And, and then the other saints that we think about, and St. Benedict and St. Catherine of Siena, and all of those saints, they inspire us and they're a part of our life. And we, we really do believe that they are saints. But, but the fact is that when we pray those names, they seem so distant. They seem so long ago. Like it's even hard to connect with those saints at times. And the amazing thing about our given day and age is that we live in an age when you and I have seen multiple saints that we know canonized. That is very uncommon. There are many generations who have lived upon this earth and never saw a saint that they actually knew be canonized into the church. You know, Saint John the 23rd, Saint Teresa of Calcutta, Saint John Paul II, these are people, how many, how many of us have ever met one of these people? Just raise your hands. All right, some of us that are here who actually met uh, some of the saints that I'm talking about, but we feel like we have a relationship with them. We, we saw them on TV, we read about them, we know of their life histories and their stories. Um, there are things that they did that we could recount. We live in a given day and age where this litany and this canon of saints isn't just about the old saints that we never knew that seem so old, we know a lot of the saints in our own given day and age. We talk to them. We listen to them. And it is even more convincing then that in the face of death that they continue to live and that we continue to pray to them. We continue to converse with them. We continue to ask for their support and their help as we've shared the relationship with them here upon the earth. Now we share that relationship between the earth and heaven. Now, as Father Paul mentioned, I did have the opportunity to study in Rome uh, for some time. And if you live in, the, if you live in Washington, D.C., sooner or later, you're going to meet the President of the United States. The same is true in Rome. If you live in Rome, sooner or later, you're going to meet the Pope. And so when I was studying in Rome, um, I had that opportunity with Pope John Paul. I was in the graduate school at that time at the Casa Santa Maria. It was a Friday night. My phone rang. And it was one of the Monsignors uh, who served the Pope. And he asked me if I would be open to coming to the Pope's chapel the next morning on Saturday, that there was going to be a delegation from the United States 
that they wanted somebody to do the readings in English, and the North American College had suggested my name. Would you like to come and read at the Mass with the Pope tomorrow morning? Well, let me check my calendar and see if I'm available. <laughs> of course, of course I'll come. And so he said, make sure that you are there tomorrow at 7.30. At 7.30, come to the palace. I'll meet you in the Pope's palace or his residence in the, the main entrance. Well, I hung up the phone. You can only imagine. I'm going to have mass with the Pope tomorrow. And, and then all of a sudden I started to think, oh my gosh, there were so many questions I should have asked them. Like when I have mass with the Pope, like what am I supposed to wear? Okay, let me think about this. All right, I'll wear my black shirt. All right, I'll wear my black pants. Okay, my black shoes. Okay, I got that down. That's what I'm going to wear tomorrow. And then what, what time did he say? You know, I was so worried that I didn't hear the right time and that I was going to come and be like an hour late that even though it was 7.30 was the time, and I was pretty sure, I mean, I was there at 6.30. I just could not take a chance. I had misheard it, or I, I misunderstood it. So sure enough, at 7.30, down comes the Monsignor. And the doors open up, and we start to walk down. Now, in the uh, palace where the Pope lives, and actually Pope Francis doesn't live there, but at that time, John Paul II did, um, there are long hallway corridors that you got to walk to get to the papal residence, to get to the Pope's chapel. And, and these are like long hallways, marble floors, very decorated walls, big windows with light flashing in. And as the Monsignor and I are walking along and our heels are clicking going down this long hallway, what do I have going through my mind as I'm going to see the Pope? Oreo, brio, oh. Oh, it was just like the Wizard of Oz, that scene in the Wizard of Oz. And then we got to the chapel. Now, what I didn't realize about the Pope's chapel, it seats about 30 to 35 people. It's a very small chapel. And so all of a sudden, I'm looking around, and I see the Pope's presider's chair is like right here, and the lectern to read is like right here. Now, all of a sudden, I'm thinking, don't make a fool of yourself. Don't faint. Beads of sweat begin to roll down my arms off my forehead. Oh my gosh, this, I didn't realize everything was so tight and everything was so close. Sure enough, the American delegation came. I had my place. In comes Pope John Paul II. He sits down in his chair. Um, or he begins the Mass, sits down in his chair. Comes time for the readings. So I get up. I come walking around. I get up to do the reading. And I'm, I'm not kidding. Literally, I can hear him breathing next to me. It's like breathing down your neck. That's where that term comes from, all right? I looked down. I did the readings. I didn't faint. I didn't say something stupid. I didn't goof it up. So when I finished, I walked back around, and I flopped back in my chair, so relieved that I was done. Then all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there, I began to think, wait a minute. It was so late last night, I didn't have a chance to talk to anybody because right after Mass, what they do is they get those 35 people in a big circle, and then the Pope comes around and talks to each person in that circle who has been at his morning mass. And I'm sitting there thinking, what am I supposed to call him? I mean, what is, what is, it? is it? Should I call him Holy Father? I mean, is there another name? You know, how, should I kiss his ring or not kiss his... What am I going to say to him? And I mean, as the mass is going on, even though I'm trying to be attentive to Jesus as the body and blood of Jesus are in front of me, I'm thinking, my name is Father Dan Felton. I'm from the Diocese of Green Bay, Wisconsin. My name is Father Dan Felton, a priest of the Diocese of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Sure enough, the Mass ends. God's on his truth. We get in a big circle, 35 people. Pope comes walking around. Pope gets to me, and I say, Holy Father, I kiss his ring. I look him right in the eyes, and I said, Holy Father, I'm Father Dan Felton, a priest of the Diocese of Green Bay, Wisconsin. And he looked at me, and he said, Priest, Green Bay, priest. And then he just stood there. And I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't know we were going to have a conversation. I'd used up that big one line that I had been practicing up at that time. These are the next words that came out of my mouth to Pope John Paul II. Green Bay, home of the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> Like, he's going to know who the Green Bay Packers are. And I was like, oh, no, stupid. Why did you say that stupid thing? Then the Holy Spirit struck me, and the next words that came out of my mouth were, Green Bay, home of Bishop Wysislo. Oh, he said, Bishop Wysislo. Friend, Bishop, 
Say hello to Bishop for me. And then he started to walk away. Yes, Holy Father, I'll say, why am I yelling at him? He's not deaf. <laughs> so then I'm on my way back to the Casa Santa Maria. Kind of really glad that experience is done, but really on a high, I mean, talk to the Pope. I get back to, and I'm thinking, you know, I didn't even have a chance to tell the guys that I had Mass this morning. So we're having lunch. And as we're having lunch, I'm like, uh, what did you guys do this morning? You know, well, we studied, whatever, whatever. I said, well, uh, I had Mass with the Pope. You had Mass with the Pope? Yeah, I had Mass with the Pope called last night. Asked if I'd come over and have Mass with them. <laughs> and then afterwards, he wanted to talk. He talked? What did you talk about? Well, you know, guy stuff, football, and things like that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. The fact of the matter is, I had the opportunity in my lifetime to meet, to greet, to talk to a saint. Saint John Paul II. We live in a given day and age, which is very unusual, that saints would be declared in our own lifetimes that we knew. And so when we think about that litany of saints, we don't think just of the old saints who still have such a proper place, a place of respect and reverence within our church, but man, they come alive when we actually know some of the saints that share in that canon in a very special kind of way. Now, we also tend to think of saints not only as people that are a part of that canon, the church that measures up to that canon, people who live their lives with heroic virtues, people who are martyrs who have made sacrifices in their life, people that are like models, that are great examples to us, that invite us to walk that path of holiness along with them. That's not only the men and women that are a part of that litany, of that canon, of that measure of the church, but we've known men and women like that in our own lives as well, in our very ordinary, common lives as well. Oh, they may not be an official saint of the church, Oh, we may not have declared them to be a part of the litany that we sing at the Easter Vigil, but we know men and women who have been in our lives, in our common, everyday, ordinary lives, who have been a, like a saint to us, someone where we just sense that they were in a union with God. Somehow we just sense that they were filled with the grace of Jesus Christ. Somehow we just sense that they're walking on that path that's going to take them to heaven and, and they're so inspiring. They're such a model for us, such a great example for us that you just want to be around them because it feels like when I'm with them that I'm kind of walking on that same path as well. Right? Common, everyday, ordinary people by the world's standard, but not by God's standards. Four of those people in my life happen to be priests. And in fact, I pray and talk to them every morning. And one of those priests is Father Kiefer. And so Father Kiefer and I knew each other very well uh, when he was here upon the earth. Now he's in the fullness of God's heaven. And for me, Father Kiefer was a great example of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. I mean, Father Kiefer really entered into the realness of life. He was a person of great service to others, but, but Father Kiefer was someone who wasn't afraid to struggle and to grapple with the questions of life. That, that a disciple doesn't have it all together. A disciple is a learner, constantly learning things about life and about their God and how to make God real in life. And, and would stumble and fall at times, but got back up and tumbled and kept falling forward uh, as a disciple. Truly a holy man, truly a man that would inspire others, and truly a man that I pray to and with every morning. I just say, David, give me the strength to be a great disciple today. Lead me to Jesus. Just lead me to Jesus. And then I prayed to Father Charlie Elmer. Um, his family grew up here in Cooperstown, but I knew Charlie from the Casa Santa Maria when I was in Rome. Charlie was a person who just loved being a priest. He loved all things about priesthood. He loved all things about the church in a very real kind of way. He wasn't afraid to talk about the shadow side and the great challenges of the church. But, but as David was for me a great example of disciple, what it means to be a disciple, Charlie is for me a great example of what it means to be a priest. And kind of, I just ask him every day, help me to be the best priest I can be, Charlie, and lead me to Jesus. And then the third priest that I pray to every morning uh, in a very special way is Father Leo Schmidt. And as I pray to Father Leo Schmidt, Father Leo Schmidt just had a great sense of joy. Just a great sense of joy. A lot of tragedy in his life, great challenges in his life, but he always lived life with a great sense of joy. And then the fourth person I pray to, along with uh, Charlie, 
along with David, along with Leo, is Father Nicholas Gross. He was a priest in my home parish. He was there for 49 years. He was there for 49 years, but a great example of a pastor. And so he's a great example of a pastor, Charlie a great example of a priest, David a great example of a disciple, and like Leo, try to do with joy. And I just pray to them every morning, lead me to Jesus. As you all fall in love, fell in love with Jesus, as you follow Jesus, just be there and help me to walk this path of righteousness and holiness so that I pray someday I may be where you are. And so that's what I'm talking about. I mean, so the saints can be part of that official canon, and, and officially named by the church, but we have lived with saintly people. We know saintly people in our own lives. So I'm gonna give you, this time, 11 seconds, just to think to yourself, who is somebody that's been like a saint to me in my life? A mom, a dad, a coach, a teacher, a stranger, a neighbor, a grandma, grandpa? Just think to yourself, who is someone who has been like a saint to me? Someone you just kind of sense was in union with God, kind of, Someone filled with grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, kind of someone who's walking that path of holiness. Just think about that for a moment. I'm not going to ask you to share this with the person alongside of you, so don't be worried about that. Okay, for any of us that might be gathered here today, who would be some of those folks? Who would be some of those folks that we might think of? Just anybody. Grandpa, grandma, former pastor, a sister, a nun, grandpa, mother, excuse me, a sister. Ordinary, common people that all of a sudden hey, say, wait a minute. You know, I, I thought when we said saints, we're talking about those people that are official in the church, like those saints that we really look up to because that's how we hold them up as the church. We hold them up as an example. We hold them up as a model, as a source of inspiration. But all of a sudden, we begin to realize that there also is a whole other sainthood, and that sainthood is in the common, everyday, ordinary people that fill up our everyday, common, common ordinary experiences of life. They, too, are saints in union with God, filled with the grace of Jesus Christ, trying to walk that path to heaven and trying to take other people along with them. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you, when I ask you, think of someone who is holy, think of someone that you would consider a saint, think of someone in union with God, think of someone kind of filled with grace, think of someone who's trying to walk that path and take others with them. How many of you thought of you, yourself? How many of you thought of yourself? Now, isn't that amazing? Why wouldn't you think of yourself as being one of the saints in common, everyday, ordinary life who's still living here upon the earth, but is inspiring and giving model to other people as to how do we together walk this path in the fullness of God's kingdom? I mean, it's an astounding thing. Why do we think that we are not capable of being a saint? You know, some of us might say, oh, if you only knew me, I mean, I'm not a saint. You would know that I'm not a saint. I'm not perfect by any means. Well, no saint was perfect. Being a saint, saintliness is not perfection. For some of us here, we might say, oh, I know my shortcomings. If you knew my shortcomings and my limitations, I couldn't ever. You wouldn't even say you could be a saint or you, you would think of me being a saint. There isn't a saint living that didn't have shortcomings, that did not have limitations. That's not what sainthood is all about. And the fact of the matter is, we are wired, wired for sainthood. When you were created in the image and the likeness of God, God wired you for the divine. God wired you for holiness. God wired you for saintliness. Our circuits, our wires are in such a certain way that we are made, we are wired for saintliness. We are wired for holiness. We are wired to be in union with God. We are wired with the grace of Jesus Christ. And, and the fact is that we were born saints first. Then we became sinners. But we're born first saints because we're wired for sainthood. 
And in addition to that, the day that you and I were baptized, we were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We were baptized into the union of God. We were baptized into the grace of Jesus Christ. We were made one on the path of holiness with each other by virtue of our baptism. You and I are saints. You and I are wired to be saints. You and I were born saints. And it's God expectations that we will die saints. So why is it that we would find ourselves saying, oh, I would never, ever think of myself as being that saint that you were talking about? I would never think that about myself. Well, let's take a while to look at that. Why is it that you and I, and I, I would include myself, that you and I are so convinced that, that, that we could never be saints, or that we certainly are not saints, or that we're not even wired for sainthood. So let's go back and take a look at that. That first phrase, a saint is a holy one in union with God. A saint is a holy one in union with God. Why don't I believe that? Why is that so hard? That, that I was born to be that in union with God. Well, I'll tell you why. This is how we go about life. The, hell, the heavens are telling the glory of me. And all creation is shouting for me come dance in the forest come play in the field and sing sing to the glory of me i mean most of the time we go through our lives we make the sign of the cross in the name of me myself and i right the self-centeredness in our lives the selfishness in our lives the wanting to live independently in life saying to ourselves i don't need to be in union with god I don't need that union to get into life. I don't need that union to be successful in life. I don't need that union with God to be able to march on in life. One of the reasons that we might not think that we're saintly is because if being a saint is being in union with God, we're convinced that A, we don't need to be that, or secondly, strange as it might seem, I don't even want to be that in union with God because I'm not even sure what that would mean and I'm not sure what I'd have to change in my life. I'm not sure what the expectations would be for me. And so when we look at saintliness, the opposite end of saintliness is not perfection. The opposite end of saintliness is sinfulness. Saintliness, sinfulness. So what is the sin in our life that keeps us from being in union with God as we are walking this path to being saints, being who we already are called to be, being who we are already made to be. What are, the sin, what are the sins? Well, the first sin is of pride. Pride in our lives that, you know, I don't need God. Pride in our lives that I can get by without God. Pride in my life that I'm not even interested in that union with God in any way. Pride gets in the way of our need to be in union with God. And we can be so prideful. It's kind of like the guy who went to heaven. It's called the best poem in the world. I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door, not, not by the beauty of it all, nor the lights or its decor, but it was the folks, the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp, the thieves, the liars, the sinners, the trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor, who never said anything nice. And Herb, who I thought was rotting in hell, was sitting proud on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus. I said, what's the deal? I would love to hear your take. How did all of these sinners get here? God must have made a mistake. And Lord, why? Why is everybody so quiet, so somber? Give me a clue. Hush child, Jesus said. They're all in shock. No one thought they'd be seeing you. <laughs> the great pride in our life keeps us from being in union with the God that longs to be in union with us. You know, in the end, it's not that we seek to be in union with God. This being a saint has little to do with us. Part of that phrase is, we think saintliness has something to do with us, that we can make ourselves a saint. That's not what I said. God made us saints. God wired us for saintlyhood. 
God's deepest desire is to be in union with you and me. That's God's deepest desire. And God will always be there 24-7 every day of our lives. God has one longing, God has one want, and that is that we are in union with him, with our God. You know, there's that famous poem that was written, that, you know, that God is like a hound dog, that God hounds us. He looks, he follows us, he smells the trails of our life. He's there with us all the time, hounding us to be in union with him. It's at God's initiative that God desires that we be in that union. It's not a union that we make happen. It's a response to God's call to be in that union. That's what makes it happen. And the place that you and I are in the deepest communion with God, in union with God, is in communion. In communion. Why do we say that the Mass is the, the source and the summit of walking this path of saintliness? Because it's in the Mass that the Lord, first of all, comes to talk to us in the Scriptures, that the Lord is present to us in the body of Christ. But then, as wine and bread are changed into the body and the blood of God Himself, of Jesus Christ, imagine this, everything that is divine, everything that is holy, you don't think that you are filled and wired for holiness? You literally, and I literally, eat and drink God. And God, when we are in communion, we swallow God. We take God into ourself. We will never be closer to God than when we receive communion. That God is, is not far out. God isn't out there someplace. God is inside of me. God is that close to me and to my heart. And so when I talk about God seeking us like a hound, that it's God's deepest desire that we be in union with him, that's why God sent his son into the world and so loved us that he might give his son to us, God to us, in communion to be in union with God. And yet, how do we approach communion? You know, a lot of times we get back to our place, we sit down, God has come inside of me. God is in union with me. God will never get close. Everything that God is, is in me. I have it, all of it, right now. What am I going to do after Mass? Jeez, Father Paul preached a little long today. I was going to go to the grocery store, but I might not be able to get... Where did I park my car again? I just get confused all the time. Where did I park my car? Our minds are just, we get to that point, they're wandering all over the place, and they're wandering all over the place. We have this wonderful opportunity to be in union with God. God came to us. We didn't go to God. God came to us. And we, even at that time, are so filled with pride, so filled with self-centeredness, so filled with selfishness, we don't even spend any time in this union that God made happen with God who just wants to be one with us in that moment and in that time. It's like people who say to me, I don't get anything out of the Mass. You don't get any, you don't get anything out of the Mass. You got God out of this Mass. You got God coming to you. Everything that God of the universe is has come to you in this Mass to be in union with you. God and all that God is, is with you, inside of you, and one with you when you are at Mass. And as you leave Mass, God goes with you. How could we possibly say that I don't get anything out of Mass? But it's an I. I don't get anything out of the Mass. I, myself, and me as a way of life. And so why are we wired to be a saint? Why are we made to be a saint? And at other times we feel like we're not a saint. Well, it's because we're just not allowing God to do what God wants to do, God's deepest desire to do for us. And that is God just wants to be in union with me and you. All we have to do is be open to that union and God will make it happen. All we have to do is leave an eye and leave my center to go into another center and God will do everything else. God will do it all. Or another reason, another form of pride. You know, for some of us, we're so proud. I don't need God. I don't need that union with God to get by in life. Well, the opposite is just another form of pride. I'm not worthy of God. I'm not worthy of God's love. I'm not worthy of God's mercy. I'm not worthy to be in union with God. If you knew the sins in my life, if you knew my past in life, you would know how unworthy I am to be in that union with God. 
And for that reason, we say, I can't be a saint, and I certainly am not a saint, and I certainly would never think of myself being the saint that Father Dan invited me to think of when he said, who are the ordinary people in your life that are like saints? Because you see, in the end, I just, Lord, I'm least, I'm last, I'm really lost. I don't know if you can hear me, or if you're even there. I don't know if you would listen to a poor man's prayer. I know I'm just an outcast. I shouldn't speak to you. Yet I see your face and wonder. Were you once an outcast too? That excuse that we leave, use in life why I can't be a saint, why I'm not wired to be a saint. You know, I'm too least, I'm too last, I'm too lost. Well, it's for that very reason that Jesus Christ was sent into this world, wasn't it? To find the least, the last, and the lost. Didn't God send his son Jesus Christ into the world not only to be in union with us, and to break our pride, but to be in union with us in an authentic holiness as well. I mean, God's deepest desire is to say, you are worthy. I created you. You are created in my image and likeness. Why would you ever say that you are not worthy of my love, that you are not worthy of my call to holiness when I created you and I made you in my image and likeness? Who do you think you are? Are you claiming to be greater than I am in my love and in my mercy for you that you are not worthy of that? You know, it's surprising in my 35 years of life how often in confession that the challenge that is before a priest is not to convince God to forgive that person, but to convince that person that God can forgive them. To convince that person that God can forgive them. That's the great challenge. Because we say, oh, I'm so least, I'm so last, I'm so lost. Well, those are the folks that Jesus came into the world to redeem. Those are the folks that Jesus came into the world to put in union with God so that we might walk that path of saintliness. I mean, we all know the story, right, of the uh, lost sheep, all right? And it's a very familiar parable that Jesus tells. And it's an interesting thing because Jesus uh, the, talks about the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep then goes to find that one sheep. Finding that one sheep rejoices, puts that sheep upon the, the shepherd's shoulders to be in union, to be one with that sheep, walks back to the rest of the herd. Did you ever stop to think about that? Because, you know, in that parable, I think a lot of times we imagine ourselves being the 99. You know, maybe some of us are imagining ourselves being the one who has kind of gone off on the own and the shepherd comes looking for the one. But let me ask you this question. If you think you're back in this 99, when the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find the one lost sheep and finds that one lost sheep, who are the 99 lost sheep without a shepherd? The 99. That the minute the shepherd leaves them to go out looking for that other sheep and finds it, they're lost, they're least, they're last now. And they all rejoice when the shepherd comes back because they all have been found. In the end, we are all least. In the end, we are all last. In the end, we are all lost in a very powerful kind of way. And that's why God just wants to be in union with us. And so God says, be in union with me. Get over your perfection. Get over your pride. God says to you and me, get over this false sense of humility and this false sense that you're not worthy. Be in union with me. Respond to my call to be in union with me. It's kind of like the auctioneer. Once there was an auctioneer who held up a violin with his bow, and he started to cry, who will start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, who make it two? Two dollars, who make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, three dollars going and going, but no. From the back of the room came forward an old man who picked up that old violin with its bow. Well, he tightened up that old blue strings. And then he played a melody so sweet and pure as caroling angels sing. Then the auctioneer, in a voice so quiet and low, he said, what's the bidding, my folks, as he held up the violin with its bow? 
$1,000, who'll make it two? $2,000, who'll make it three? $3,000 once, $3,000 twice, $3,000 going and going and gone, and the crowd cheered, and some people cried out, what changed its value? And swift came the reply, the touch of a master's hand. Now many a soul has been bruised and beaten, much like this old violin. And the world will never understand the change that is wrought and the soul that is changed by the touch of a master's hand. In the end, being in union with God is not about us. It's being touched by the master's hand to be in union and gathered into God and to be made one. The same is true when it comes to through the grace of Jesus Christ. So we are all called to be saints in union with our God through the grace of Jesus Christ, through the love of Jesus Christ, we are called to be saints. That says to us that when we define a saint, we are in union with God by the grace of Jesus Christ, by that relationship that we share with the Lord. That the more deeply we are into the relationship with the Lord, by the grace of Jesus Christ, the more deeply we're gonna be in a union with God, and more deeply we're going to believe that we are wired and we are called even now to be saints. And so we ask ourselves a very simple question as we move through a season of Lent. Where am I at in my relationship with Jesus Christ? Some of us might say, well, I know Jesus. Some of us might say, I serve Jesus. Some of us might say, I've learned some things about Jesus. But the question that Jesus is asking us tonight, if we're on this path of holiness, if you're going to believe that you are wired to be a saint, are you in a relationship with the Jesus Christ who gives you grace to be in union with God? Where are we at in our relationship with Jesus Christ and his grace? It's kind of like when I was in college at St. Norbert College, a couple of my buddies and their girlfriends asked me to go out on a blind date. One of them had some cousin that was coming in. Blind dates, you know, geez. So I agreed to it. But as we're driving over there in this van, my two buddies, their girlfriends, myself, I said, let's make this fun. Let's say that I'm an exchange student from France that I'm going out with this blind date. So we get there, we go in, and I introduce myself. I said, uh, I am Daniel. I, I come from France. I am very happy to be with you tonight and to be taking you out. And your daughter, she, oh, she's so beautiful. And they were like, oh, honey, you get to go out with somebody from France. This is exciting, you know, whatever. We get in the car. We go out that night in the town. And while we're out that night uh, at the bars and dancing and doing whatever, she asked me all kinds of questions about France. And I told her everything that I knew about France, the music, the people, the food. And then on the way home in the van, as we're driving along, I said to her, Terai was her name. I said, Terai, do you have a good sense of humor? And she said, yes. I said, do you like uh, practical, uh, what do you Americans call this, yokes? And she said, jokes. And I said, yeah, but, uh, practical jokes. I said, well, I'm Dan Felton from Appleton, Wisconsin. <laughs> that night I found out that Terai does not have a good sense of humor. <laughs> and she does not like practical yokes. <laughs> and as I walked her to the door, just before she slammed the door in my face, this is what she said. She said, the sad thing is, and what really upsets me, is I've been out with you for a whole night and I don't even know who you are. Bam! The door slammed. Wouldn't it be sad today if we're thinking about our relationship with Jesus Christ, this relationship with Jesus, which draws us into the grace and the love of Jesus, which brings us to a union with our God. If we look at Jesus today and you say, you know, what's kind of sad is we've been together for all this time, Lord, and I don't even know who you are. We are called to that relationship in Jesus Christ. We are called to the grace that reminds us how we are wired and calls us into a union with God. You know, it's not by chance that at the end of their relationship and time of Jesus here upon the earth, he turns to Peter and he asks Peter a question. He didn't say to Peter, hey, tell me, Peter, what's your best memory of all the things that we've done together? Hey, Peter, what was your favorite miracle that we were able to work together? And instead, Jesus turns to Peter. And the last question that he asks Peter is a very simple one. Do you love me? To which Peter responds, do I love you? 
For three years now I've followed you, learned from you, fought for you, claimed you as the Messiah. If that's not love, what is? No. Jesus said to him, Peter, do you love me? To which Peter responds, hmm, do I love you? At the end of every day, and at the end of our days here upon the earth, there's only one question that comes. Have you loved and have you been loved? At the end of every day, and at the, ever, ever, at the end of every day of our life, at the end of life, there's only going to be one question that Jesus is going to ask us. Do you love me? And as we reflect upon that, we might find ourselves saying, Do I love you? What do you mean, do I love you? For years and years I followed you, went to Mass, paid my dues, claimed you as the Son of God. If that's not love, what is? But Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm asking, do you love me? To which we respond, hmm, do I love you? Because in the end, if we have a deep relationship with Jesus Christ, and if we are in union with the grace which he gives to us first, his love to us first, his grace to us first, in that relationship of life and of love, then it is Jesus himself who will lead us to God, his Father, and through Jesus we will be in union with God. Not by our doing, but by the doing of Jesus. It is Jesus' deepest desire to love us deepest desire to fill us with his grace. It is Jesus' deepest desire to lead us to God the Father so that we might be in union with that Father, so that we might be walking that path of holiness, that path of righteousness, that we have been wired to walk, that we were made to walk, that we ultimately are called to walk as saints of God in a very real and profound kind of way. And then finally, as you're thinking about that call to union and why is that so challenging and maybe that's why it's hard for me to believe that I'm a saint and as we're talking about the grace of Jesus Christ and thinking about man that relationship with Jesus and how difficult that relationship is or how shallow that might be in my life then that leads to the third part of that definition that that not only are we called to be in union with God God constantly calling us to be in that union not only are, we, not only are we called to be in that relationship with Jesus Christ, filled with his bounty of grace, filled with his love, not by our doing, but by his doing, the third part of the definition of what it means to be a saint, which leads that Holy One and others to heaven. Which leads that Holy One and others to heaven. In other words, even when I'm in union with God, even when I'm filled with the grace of Jesus Christ, even when I know who I am, that I'm a saint, I'm wired to be a saint, I was made to be a saint, it's not just for my salvation, it's not just to get my soul to heaven. When we reflect upon the great saints of the church, be they ancient, be they new, what they did was they gave model to, they gave example to, they took other people with them in a very profound and real kind of way. That it's not just to get myself into heaven, but it's to get me and those whose lives I would touch into heaven as well. You know, sometimes I think that if we are walking that path in a very powerful kind of way and we get to heaven someday, that there's going to be this rejoicing at the pearly gates that we got there. And, and certainly there's going to be a great sense of joy in the fullness, a great sense of glory in the fullness of heaven. But, but I wonder, as Jesus is standing there and as Jesus is getting ready to embrace us, to celebrate that you and I got to Kevin, if the next question that's going to follow is this. Who did you bring along? Who did you bring along? Did you bring your wife? Did you bring your husband? Did you bring your son, your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter? Did you bring your neighbor? Did you bring your co-worker? Did you bring your teacher? Did you bring your coach? Did you bring the person that you served at the homeless shelter? Did you bring the person that sat next to you or in the row behind you at church? In the end, the definition of a saint 
isn't self-centered. The definition of a saint isn't about me. The definition of a saint is that God leads me, God wants me, God uses me as an instrument to be able to help others to get to heaven, to realize that they too have been wired to be a saint. And this is how we can walk that path together to the glory of God and God's throne in heaven. And so we just simply ask ourselves, who these days are we accompanying as saints, accompanying in a common challenge of holiness, accompanying and walking with so that we together are going to get into the fullness of God's heaven. When I was in high school, I was captain of the track team at Appleton West. And while I was in high school, Menasha High School built a new school and a track facility. Now, I don't know why, and it has nothing to do with Menasha, but they did the, the weirdest thing, the strangest thing. That, that they built a track where the 220-yard dash, by the way, I have two records in track that will never be broken. I have a 50-yard dash record at Einstein Junior High School, and I have a mile relay record at Einstein Junior High School that will never be broken. Do you want to know why? Because it was in yards. And so now they run in meters, so those records are going to hold forever. But anyway, besides that. They made the, the 220 dash, which started in the middle of the track, and then you would do the curve, you would do the curve, and it ended up in the middle of the track. Oh, no, not in Menasha. In Menasha, you started up on the corner, up here. Not in the, not in the center, but you started in the corner. So right away, you were into a curve. Right away, you were into another curve. And then you had this long stretch, almost like a hundred and plus yard stretch that you would be running down the track in that way. So, time came for the meet against Menasha, Appleton West, Appleton team, and got down to my blocks, boom, gun goes off, boom, I'm out of the blocks, coming around the first curve tight, coming around the second curve, leaning in, coming down the straightaway. As I'm coming around the straightaway, I pull out from the rest of the group, and I'm leading, I'm gonna win this race. And so as I'm coming down and coming down and coming down and coming down, two groups of people right here, finish line, and I finish, throw my chest out, go across the finish line, I start to slow up, and I look back at my dad who's in the stands. And my dad is up in the stands, and as he's looking at me, he's going. <laughs> and I looked, and here, the finish line was not just two clumps of people. The finish line was about seven yards in front of me. All of a sudden, I saw the string, and in that moment, boom, 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 boom. Rather than being first, I was last. In that moment in time, not only did my father console me, but in that moment in time, I was reminded that, that kind of that's what it's like to be a saint. That's what it means to accompany each other. Uh, be that your wife, be that your husband, be that your kids, be that your neighbor, be that a stranger. It's kind of like saints are going to fall. Saints are also sinners. That's our human nature. But we're saints first and we're sinners second. The exception is sinfulness. We're wired to be saints and saintfulness. But there are going to be moments and times when saints and sinners fall to the ground. And Father Lee used to say, there's only one difference between a saint and a sinner. They both fall to the ground. But only the saint gets back up again and continues the journey, believing in the power of God, believing in that grace of Jesus Christ to continue the journey. And it's the sinner who stays on the ground with pride and unworthiness and never gets up and walks the rest of the race. That's the difference between a saint and a sinner. And, and when we are saints with one another, when we are accompanying one another as saints, when we believe in this great litany of saints, this communion of saints that we profess in the creed, this great cloud of saints who are constantly with us as they have been with us throughout this presentation, and as we prayed the litany of saints, they are the folks that when we fall down to the ground, that they are saying, get up, go, go. We're not to the finish line yet. And there are moments and times when maybe it's your wife that falls, when it's your husband that falls, it's your kids that fall, it's your neighbor that falls, it's a coach that falls, it's somebody that you don't even know that falls, and you are the saint saying, get up, go, go, go. We're not to the finish line yet. 
It's because we're there for one another. That's what it means to be a saint, that we pick each other up, we encourage one another, we support one another, so that together we might cross that finish line. Together we might enter into the fullness of God's heaven. Together that we might be there with one another. Kind of to be a saint, to accompany one another, we simply say, Will you let me be your servant? Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the strength to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. We are here to help each other get someday to heaven's door. And that, my friends, is why you are a saint. That, my friends, is why we are called in this Lenten season to be in union with God by the grace of Jesus Christ so that we might be the one to walk with other ones into the fullness of God's reign. And that's why, my friends, we can honestly stand tonight at this time <laughs> and proclaim who and whose we are. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in. One more time, here we go. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father Dan. Thank you for that wonderful, inspirational evening on the third night of our mission. Um, I'm sure we're going to take away a lot of what Father Dan shared with us tonight and apply it to our own lives. Uh, I want to thank a few other people tonight. Um, most of all, Pete Winkle, who was our technologist for the last three nights. Thank you, Pete. And Bob and Joan Peters, who took care of our hospitality, along with Linda Barrett, and I better not forget anybody, um, Diana Ball, um, George and, no, yes, George and Margaret Georgia, um, and Jean Pidgeon. So thank you, everyone, for, and thanks for coming. Thank you for coming tonight. So help yourselves to hospitality. Um, Father Paul would like to say a few words. Ta-da. She did all the organizing. All the deets, you know. I get the ideas. She works them all out. It's yin and yang. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless. Yeah, stay for a while and enjoy. Thank you, Father Dan.